Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Happy Practice Podcast. I am your host, Adam Sierra, and today I am joined by someone who is not only a practitioner, not only an author, not only the CEO of a tech company, uh, but also just an all-around awesome human being, Dr. Brianna Rue. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Adam. Excited to be here. Uh, we're excited to have you. So for those uninitiated, uh, the way that we always do the show is we always start by talking about you and your background story, and then we'll kind of get to the topic, which is your book. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. I mean, the story goes for many of us that uh, second grade, couldn't really see the board. Parents didn't know it. Got my first pair of glasses. And that's when I really think I became an optometrist. So I've been doing this for quite some time. Grew up in the industry. My dad had two friends that were both optometrists. And loved the business side of optometry, always wanted to be a doctor, and it kind of joined the two together, pursued school, and always knew growing up in those private practices that I wanted to own my own, and walked into the practice that I now fully outright own, uh, became a partner in 2015, bought him out about a year ago, and have two wonderful associates, and a, there's a team now of 13 people and growing. It's amazing. It's everything that I thought it would be. Um, it's both hard work. It's invigorating between patients and the business and wrapping it all together. How do you balance everything? I figured out actually after I had my first baby, who is now eight, Dalton, that it really came down to getting things off of my plate. And the people that I had around me were really there to help me. I was bad at asking for help or asking for help where I needed it and then letting them do it and letting them fly. And so when I was on maternity leave, I remember driving by my practice. We had just hired another associate to join us and take my maternity leave so I could be with the baby and be a mom. And I drove by and the practice was successful and I wasn't in there and we kept her on and away we went. And so it's just about doing the pieces that you love getting the stuff that takes away that piece of you because someone else is going to want to do it. So again, it's just surrounding yourself by wonderful people and giving them the chance. I think so many times I see practice owners, you know, on the other side of this really struggle with getting things off of their plate, whether it's through trust issues that you may have had, maybe you had a bad experience with another employee and now you're kind of jaded but do work around that. Figure out what they love, what you love, merge it. Well, and I think especially for somebody who started a practice, you know, it kind of becomes your baby and it can be hard to let a piece of that go. Yeah, 100%. That's exactly what it's about. You wrote the I Pitch book. What inspired you to write this? So really it comes from being a doctor on that side of the table in the exhibit hall. Then on the other side of the exhibit hall with Dr. Contact Lens, in selling now to the industry. And growing up, my dad was a, you know, my parents owned a furniture business, so they've been in sales forever. So stories and stories just about salespeople and putting yourself out there. And just realizing it's really hard on that side of the table. And we're not leaning in, we're not having the right conversations. In 2009, when I graduated, Really, if you look about it, doctors, their egos have kind of been stripped slowly and slowly away from us. So in the 90s, they started calling us all providers. Providers is a blanket statement. No, man, you're a doctor. You went to school, act like one, be one, but they really kind of took that away. So the whining and dining, as you know, has gone away. That like, Zaza is like, just, it's been stripped. And that actually hurts the industry. So what the book was inspired by was people just like running by our booths where it's like, stop, just have a conversation and realize that when you're a doctor in that room, everybody's trying to pitch you. Everyone's trying to sell you. So what does that make you? It makes you the shark, right? And we're not acting like sharks. So it's showing you how to have a get to a yes, get to a no, get to a not right now and just have better conversations. Well, it's so important, especially because you need a lot of technology to stay innovative in your practice. A little bit, a little bit. From what you're saying, it sounds like people aren't really experienced buyers in that, and there's a way to be even a, a great buyer. 
and make sure that you're really filling your practice with the best technology available. Yeah, and that's how we built our clinic. So when I joined it in 2010, I mean, I joined it into a recession, right? Right into a recession. And it was still on paper record. It was my job to find an EMR, get us converted over to an EMR. I still like have nightmares about these charts and like scanning everything in. Should have hired a company. Um, Again, understanding the value of your time, please. And then seeing things come on board. So I had gone to my dentist in 2010 because I couldn't go back to Colorado anymore. So to find a dentist in Fort Lauderdale, right? And this is still like Google reviews were just kind of coming out. And when I left my dentist, I got a text saying, hey, how was your visit? Review us. And then I got the messages all before, like your appointment is this time and this time and sit this time. Won't say the name of the company that we ended up going with, uh, but I was one of the first optometrists to sign up for that company. They're like, we're not even in this vertical. Like we're in dentistry. Okay, we'll figure it out. Same thing. So when I walked back or when I went back to the office, realizing people were calling to confirm appointments. That was so antiquated already in 2010. So we just hit the ground running in getting on board with that company. Obviously, cool kids on the block come by because you guys were innovative. You were with it, right? Text messaging got really, really big in 2014, 2015. And that other company wasn't doing that yet. So we switched. This is what I was liking. This is where the future was going. And if I look back at how we built the practice, it wasn't by really adding more people. It's by adding tech and adding efficiencies within the practice. Totally. And that's the way that you used to scale. It is 100% how the way you scale. Talking about practice growth, that's one of the things you talk about in this book, right? Yeah. What are some of the skills that people can use to grow their practice that you discuss in the book that are like really easy to implement that people can implement right now? Yeah. Understanding, again, I have like a hole in my wall from like selling to my colleagues. So I have a concussion right here, so I'm probably still recovering. But we realize, or I realize too, that we have our clinical mind and we have our business mind, okay? And they're two very separate sets, right? And we're told in so many of these halls that we're really bad at business. Well, yeah, we went to optometry school. We went to dentist school, like dental school. We went to be chiropractors, whatever it was, or an MD. And yeah, we didn't take any business classes, but it doesn't mean you can't learn it that you can't pick up a book, that you can't apply it, learn everything else about your profession, right? Learn how to make money in it. You're allowed to make money, guys. So you have your clinical mind where first you're taught to do no harm. Don't take risk. You have to be sure in patient care. In the business side, you have to take risk. You have to be uncomfortable in order to move forward. So my reps are really what brought our practice forward because I was saying yes to these conversations, realizing they're in eight other stores that day before yours. They know who's moving, they know who's shaking, they know who's jamming, and they don't. They know who's saying yes, and they know who's saying no. And so this is just, again, analyzing the conversations, but giving you the tools, the questions here, to again, yes, no, not right now, and get your team involved in that. Because if I try to implement we and someone's not on board with it, they're going to revolt. So it also becomes just that tool when we go to all these shows or conferences to come back with something that now you can analyze and you're making an educated decision and an informed decision over an emotional one. Love that. And there's obviously always going to be misconceptions, right? What are some of the common misconceptions you see from your fellow doctors and maybe other people in the industry about developing your business, about growing your practice, and about working with vendors? We're really scared to make a mistake. We're really scared to spend money um, for something like Weave or Dr. Contact Lens. Like, I'll put my business there. It's $8 a day, right? On something that's 30% of your revenue. But we're so scared of it. You wasted that money before you even walked into your door that day. So that's where, again, not looking at the cost, but looking at the investment 
in how many more patients it's going to retain, how it's going to make your practice look, right? And how you're going to move it forward because patients notice all of that. And that's, again, how you grow. You know, in 2025, there's obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of emerging technologies. Why should doctors be embracing the latest and greatest in technology? So I was recently at the Capital Factory in Austin, and the CEO of the Capital Factory, which is this incubator for tech and up-and-coming stuff. And the way now that we're looking at business, he goes, your, your job's not going to be taken by AI or artificial intelligence. It's going to be someone that knows how to use artificial intelligence that's going to take your job. And so that got me thinking where he goes, goes on to say, too, we as optometrists or dentists or whatever vertical that you're in, you're like, I'm an optometrist who happens to own a business. No, you're a business owner who happens to practice optometry. Take that a step further. No, you're a tech company that happens to practice eye care. So when you make that transition, now you can kind of take the veil off and see things for what it is. And also be part of the solution. Companies like Weave, companies like Dr. Contact Lens, we listen to our customers. It's their product more than it's our companies. So be part of that build. And that's when fascinating things can happen. And you, know, you talk about your fellow practitioners. Sometimes we look at fellow practitioners or you know people that are running other offices as competition. How do you view the competitive landscape? I actually don't view anybody as competition. We're all in this together. It's about growing the pie. It's not about taking your piece of the pie. So when I see someone up the street from me make a terrible business decision in like a tech, for instance, that's stealing all their information, they're stealing now all of my information, right? So again, it's looking at the collective. There's plenty of patience in this universe for us all to see. We're just not seeing them effectively, efficiently, and taking care of them all the way through. So in our practice, it's every patient, every encounter, every time is the motto. So I find that it's now, it's so on to the next. Okay, I messed up that patient. They walked with a copy of their contact lens prescription. Oh, I've got another one behind them. No. So it's plugging up these leaky buckets behind you to stay competitive. So it's not my fellow people that are competition. It's people that are innovating really kind of over the top of that. So that's where I view competition a little bit different. I, and I love that you say it's not about taking your slice of the pie. Success is like this pie factory that just produces an infinite amount of pies. You know what I mean? Exactly. So it's like abundant thinking versus limited thinking. 100%. And the best practitioners that I know, that I've met in doing this, you know, I'm that rep that you talked about that goes to visit the 10 practices a day and you see the ones that are doing well. And the ones that are doing really well are the ones that really embrace more collaboration over competition. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I love that collaboration over competition. We've talked about some issues and some struggles. My last question, what are some reasons to be excited about healthcare? Oh, my goodness. Especially eye care, dentistry, like all of it, right? Eye care is healthcare at this point. Your dental care is actually your health care now, too. So with what's coming, there's not enough of us. And I will take that statement back. There's plenty of us. But the way that we're doing it, seeing 10 patients a day or 15 patients a day or even 20 patients a day, it's not going to cut it. So you have to get more efficient. I'm not telling you to see more patients if that's your comfort zone. But if you're artificially booked out two months, seeing 12 patients a day, you're doing something ineffectively. So don't do it to like the point of fatigue, right? Because if I added 10 more patients but didn't change any of the process, I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to burn out, right? But if I put efficiencies in there where it feels like I saw 10 but I really saw 20, that's where this all comes together. So I'm excited for all these industries, for healthcare in general. Um, patients need us more than ever. We, it's like sick care over healthcare at this point. I think we're getting better. 
but where tools are coming in for AI to detect disease, to put in better processes, better plans for a patient, looking at you as a whole, that's where the magic is. And we can, we're the piece to put that all together. So just understand you as the doctor, the center of that universe. And if we keep legislating ourselves out of it with online testing and things like that, that's what is dangerous. Put yourself into it. Don't instantly go in with a no. Ask better questions. Dr. Rue, how can everyone find you? I'm LinkedIn is definitely my jam. Um, so it's Brianna Rue, R-H-U-E. And that's really where I am these days. Thank you so much for joining the show. I know I learned a ton. It's always fantastic talking with you. And I love the energy and passion that you bring to the table. And thank you, everybody who participated in this, whether you're watching or listening. And until next time, stay happy. Take care.